Uh, the next speaker is Douglas Stanford from Stanford, who is going to comment on replica wormholes. Okay, thanks. Let me get this going. Uh, how does that look? Look great. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much to the organizers and um, for the opportunity to speak. Um, this talk is based partly on work that, uh, with Jeff Pennington, Steve Schenker, and Jenpin Yang, and partly on some work that's in progress. So what we're going to do is um, discuss two questions, uh, two sort of unrelated questions having to do with replica wormholes. The first one is this, how can acting in the radiation create a particle behind the horizon? If the radiation of an old black hole describes the island behind the horizon, then um, it should be possible. But how exactly does geometry show us that it works? So that's the first question. And the second one is, um, to what extent do the replica wormholes involved in the page curve require an ensemble interpretation? Sometimes these space-time wormholes, Euclidean wormholes, um, do require an ensemble interpretation. Is that the case here or, um, or is it not? Okay, so that's the plan. So first part, um, how to create a particle behind the horizon. And um, the main reference for this part is this paper. But um, I'd also like to highlight this earlier paper here where a tool called the PETS map was introduced to holographers and also a beautiful paper by Yiming Chen um, with another method of solving the problem that we'll discuss. So um, I'm going to continue working in this very simple toy model um, that Jeff described. And I'll remind you that here's the black hole solution, the basic black hole solution in Lorentzian signature on the left and Euclidean signature on the right. The black dot here is the horizon and we can think of a horizontal slice going through here as um, a spatial slice, which is common to both the Euclidean and Lorentzian geometries. So in particular, the region between the black dot and this blue end of the world brain, that's like a spatial slice of the region behind the horizon. This is like the spatial slice of the region um, inside the black hole. Okay. So we're gonna be working in, um, in Euclidean signature. So we'll be drawing diagrams like the one on the right here. And what is our goal? Our goal is to create a particle behind the horizon. And we can represent the action of a particle creation operator behind the horizon as giving us a space time like this. So this is the kind of space time that we want to create. There's a branch cut here that separates versions of the interior with and without this extra particle. The particle is drawn with this um, dashed orange line. The question is, how does this happen? How do we actually produce a space-time like this by acting in some way on the radiation? And I should warn you that I feel like our understanding of this is not optimal, but I'm going to tell you kind of what we know, uh, what we think we know, and maybe somebody can push it for further. So here's the basic picture. Um, somebody acts with a special operator, very finely tuned, in the radiation system. And then when you go to compute the matrix element, some matrix element of that special operator, the dominant contribution to it comes from a wormhole geometry. So here's a picture of the wormhole geometry. We'll discuss a little bit more about it later, but it has two, um, for the moment, two asymptotic boundaries. One of them corresponds to our actual physical black hole, and the other one corresponds somehow to the radiation or to a quantum computer acting on the radiation. And, um, okay, so there's this particle here, which is the dashed orange line, which is going on this Euclidean trajectory between the two boundaries. All right. So this wormhole, at least topologically, can be written, rewritten by gluing together two um, geometries, like I showed on the right here, gluing them together along their branch cuts. And if we focus on the rightmost subdiagram, then um, that's actually the space time that we wanted to construct. So that was our target. That was the thing that we wanted to understand how it arises. And here we see that it arises as sort of half of this wormhole. The wormhole appears when you act with this special operator. Um, 
so if we um, we can think about this wormhole, I guess, sort of like we're computing some funny observable. And the funny observable has a dominant contribution from some kind of instanton effect. But because of the large amount of entanglement, uh, the large k parameter in Jeff's talk, um, this instanton effect is actually not suppressed. It's order one. Okay. So this is the basic picture. And what I'm going to try to do is answer a couple of obvious follow-up questions that you might have um, to this picture. So one question, what operator are we supposed to act with on the radiation to make this happen? Um, and then what does it even mean for a wormhole to connect to a quantum computer? Um, and then finally, this one is more of a comment than a question, but uh, this equation here is true topologically but not geometrically. Um, what's going on with that? Okay, so let's go to this question first. Um, what operator are you supposed to act with on the radiation to make this happen? So a very simple example is to think about a case where there's just two states of the total system. So the total system consists of the black hole and the radiation. And state zero is a state, an entangled state of the black hole and the radiation with um, no particle behind the horizon. State one is the same thing, but just with a particle added behind the horizon. So these are both entangled states of the black hole and the radiation. State one has the particle, state zero does not. And our goal is to turn state zero into state one. And while it's obvious that this operator here would do the job, um, but this operator is not allowed because it acts on the the total state of the system. It acts on the tensor product of the black hole, B, and the radiation, R. And what we want is an operator that acts only on R, only on the radiation. So this one, while it would do the job if we were allowed to use it, um, is not allowed. Okay, so there's a very naive guess for how you can fix it. Um, you can just take the trace over the black hole of the naive operator and then multiply it by some constant. So this is, I feel, a sort of a ridiculously naive proposal. It's like, here's an operator that works. You want an operator that acts only on the radiation? Well, I'll give you one. I'll just trace it over the black hole. But actually, this sometimes works. Um, but a choice of operator that works better, and more generally, is a sort of a fancier version of this, defined using this tool called the PETS map. And for details on that, I'll refer you to the paper I cited a couple slides ago. But for this particular case, what it works out to is the following. We take the ridiculously naive operator that we had written down before, and then we multiply it both on the left and the right by this operator sigma to the minus one half, where sigma is a similar trace over the black hole of the projector onto both of the states that we're interested in. Okay. <clears throat> So that's the operator that we're supposed to um, act with um, on the radiation. And when you compute matrix elements of this operator after the page time, a wormhole geometry dominates the computation. And I'm not going to show this to you in detail because it's very similar to the discussion of the entropy um, in Jeff's talk, in particular the interplay between the K parameter and the E to the minus S naught parameter is the same. I also want to mention that this operator is highly state dependent in a way that was anticipated in earlier work by Papadotamus and Raju and by Verlinde and Verlinde. Okay, so next question. Um, what does it mean for a wormhole to connect to a quantum computer? And the answer to this question is not going to be very satisfying, but uh, it's the best uh, that we can do at the moment. So the operator that we're acting with, this PETS map operator, acts only on the radiation. That was the rule, it has to act only on the radiation. But it involves in various places a partial trace over an operator that acts on the black hole. So there's some version of the black hole inside this operator. We're tracing over it. And you could imagine that to implement this operator, a quantum computer might simulate a second copy of the black hole. And it's this simulated copy of the black hole that can connect by wormhole to the physical black hole. That's actually what's happening in these um, wormhole geometries. Okay, and then the final 
final question. Um, this equation, this basic picture of the wormhole here, um, inducing the geometry that we wanted on the black hole side, this thing is true topologically, but it's not correct geometrically. Like the conical angles don't work out at this point. So fixing this is actually the role of these factors of sigma to the minus one half in the PETS map. So to explain this, it's helpful to think about this PETS map operator using a type of replica trick where we temporarily define a more general operator with powers sigma to the power n, and then we'll take a limit, n goes to minus one half. And if you work out the type of wormhole that forms for integer n, it looks like this pinwheel diagram where the shaded blue part is the part that's associated to the physical black hole, and the rest of it is associated to either this factor here or the factors of sigma, n factors of sigma above and n factors below. And now there's an honest geometrical statement, which is as you take n to minus one half of this geometry, then the shaded blue region becomes exactly what we wanted. <coughs> okay. So that's the end of the first part. Now we're going to move, switch gears to um, a different topic. And um, I want to highlight some recent work by these authors, uh, which addresses the same type of questions, but from a somewhat different perspective. So it came as a surprise um, about a year ago that semi-classical gravity can compute the page curve. And over the past couple of years, also that it can compute average values of late time correlation functions. Previously, I guess it was thought um, that to compute these things, we would need a bulk description that has manifest microstates. Um, I certainly thought that. Um, but in retrospect, we may have been sort of misunderstanding what semi-classical gravity describes. And so here's a possible improvement on that picture. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, I'm not sure. But the proposal is that gravity describes an ensemble average of quantum systems, including finite entropy effects, over an ensemble that may or may not be well-defined. So it seems kind of obvious that a simple gravity description doesn't have enough stuff in it to fully describe a large, complicated quantum system. But the, what seems to be true is that gravity doesn't just throw out the fine-grained, um, finite entropy, intrinsically quantum, grainy features. Instead, it sort of averages over them, and that's subtly different. So um, sometimes people like to think about an analogy. They say gravity is a little bit like hydrodynamics. But it seems like maybe a better analogy would be gravity is sort of like hydrodynamics, but also with some kind of average description of Brownian motion, something that you would have thought required a molecular description. Anyhow, so that's some, that's some um, proposal. And there are some simple pure gravity theories where souped up semi-classical gravity, basically simple gravity, is all there is. And such theories are fundamentally dual to ensembles. So JT gravity, JT gravity with defects, um, maybe 3D gravity. But in string theory, semi-classical gravity is not all there is. We have strings, we have brains, and um, frankly, we have more work to do to really understand black holes here. Some ideas along this direction include um, fuzzballs, eigenbrains, baby universes. This stuff is really interesting and I think really important, and I'm not going to talk about it in the rest of the talk. Instead, what I'm going to do is um, try to explore a little bit more the interplay between this ensemble average picture and the um, page curve computation. So I'm going to start by reviewing a sort of old story, uh, the connection between space-time wormholes and ensemble averages. And I'll do this in the context of ADS-CFT and to draw pictures actually we'll use ADS-2-CFT-1. So in this um, version of ADS-CFT, the way the dictionary works, is that time contours of the boundary theory become um, boundary conditions to be filled in by the bulk theory in some way. So my favorite example of this, a simple example is, suppose we're just trying to compute the thermal partition function in the boundary theory, Z of beta. 
That's trace e to the minus beta h in the boundary theory. Well, the time contour associated to z of beta is a circle, the thermal circle of length beta. That's the contour of the system that you put the, it's the contour that you put the system on in order to compute this observable. And in ADS-CFT, we think about that circle as a boundary condition that should be filled in with gravity, like some kind of geometry like this, uh, um, which has a circle as a boundary. Okay. Now let's consider the quantity z of beta squared. The, the time contours to compute that are just two copies of the same thing. So two of these circles here, two thermal circles for two independent copies of the system. And because z of beta squared is, well, it's the square of z of beta, then we might expect that we should just fill these in in the same way that we did um, in the first step. And we'll just obviously get the square of the previous computation. But, um, and this is where it gets interesting, there can also be contributions from a connected geometry, a wormhole that connects together in the bulk these disconnected boundary conditions. And there's just a flat out contradiction between saying that z of beta is equal to this um, and saying that z of beta squared is equal to this. So one possible resolution of this is to say that what gravity is computing is an ensemble average. So we invent some angle brackets um, and put them around all the observables. And then we say there's no contradiction between the statement that the average over some ensemble of z of beta is given by this geometry and the average over that ensemble of z of beta squared is given by these geometries here. What it means is that the variance in this ensemble of z of beta is given by the wormhole. So as I said, this is really an old story that goes back to work of Coleman, Giddings, and Strominger, and in the context of ADS-CFT, Maldasena and Maus, Arkani Hamed, Polchinski, and Orgera. And qualitatively, the flavor of the discussion around wormholes has been, roughly speaking, that wormholes are bad. They represent some kind of um, failure of factorization, and we need to figure out how to cancel them or remove them. So, so they're sort of viewed in a negative way. Um, <clears throat> so over the last two years, we've seen something sort of positive come out of these wormholes though, which is that they give the right answer for the ensemble average of um, noise in various quantities due to the underlying discreteness of quantum mechanics. I'm not going to describe these in detail, but um, because of the discrete spectrum of states in the quantum system, certain observables have a type of irreducible quantum noise, random erratically fluctuating curve that's sort of a little bit like the trace of a particle undergoing Brownian motion. And um, these geometries, these results by these various authors compute quantities that basically give the ensemble average of that quantum noise. So they accurately compute, they give the right answer for something, but it's not an individual erratic trace. It's some kind of average of that. So they're doing something good. <clears throat> but it's something good that has to be interpreted in the context of an ensemble. So here's the question we want to address. Do the replica wormholes <clears throat> for the page curve need an ensemble interpretation like this? So let's start by setting up a case where the replica wormholes uh, for the page curve are, are relevant. So this contour here is going to take a tiny bit of explaining, so let's do that. Um, what we have is a state of a black hole interacting with a bath evolving forwards in time. So these semicircular arcs here of the black hole system and of the bath system represent the Euclidean state preparation. They're preparing some kind of thermal state of the bath and some kind of thermal state of the black hole. And then we evolve forwards in time. The red dashed lines indicate interactions between the bath and the black hole system. To make the drawings a little bit simpler, um, we're using this two-sided black hole. So the black hole starts out as two entangled um, copies, and the bath also starts out as two entangled copies. And we're um, interacting one copy from each system and letting them evolve forwards in time. So that's the time contour for what we're describing. 
And if you want to think about a bulk picture, um, then it looks roughly something like this. Um, the black hole geometry gets filled in by this um, two-sided black hole that um, Juan described in his talk, where we're evolving forwards on one side of the black hole, coupled to the band. Okay. So we start out with a black hole in a pure state and the bath in a pure state, but we evolve forwards in time and they interact and the entropy increases. So suppose we want to compute the entropy and to make life easy, let's imagine we want to compute the Rennie entropy, trace rho squared for the two blue dots, so the total black hole system. Well, that's given by a time contour that looks like this. Um, if you look at the southwest corner of this diagram, it looks like the time contour that we drew in the top left, and they get glued together in this interesting way. Two copies of the black hole, two copies of the bath. The red lines indicate interactions. At late times, the dominant way of filling in these boundary conditions, these time contours, um, is a wormhole. So geometry wants to fill these things in with a wormhole at late times. The wormhole connects together the two copies of the black hole. So this is the replica wormhole of the page curve. Um, but notice that it's actually okay. There's no obvious contradiction yet because um, the different boundary conditions are themselves coupled together by the interactions. So there's no immediate problem with a wormhole connecting the two black holes because the boundary conditions are also connected. So we don't yet require an ensemble interpretation. But what happens if we replace the interactions with the bath in this picture? So the interactions between the two black hole systems mediated by the bath. Um, what happens if we replace the interactions with the bath by some fixed operator insertions? So that's the time contours that are drawn here. We've deleted the bath systems altogether. And we just have a collection of insertions of these V operators and W operators. Notice that now the, these um, time contours are factorized. So there's no interactions between them. We just have operator insertions. So first of all, what does this quantity mean? Um, and second, is the wormhole still there? So first, let's address what the quantity means. So each of these two um, identical time contours computes the inner product of two states of the black hole. Um, they're the two states of the black hole that are left behind after two different specific histories of Hawking radiation. So this contour here with the Euclidean part and then the Lorentzian part going forwards and back, that represents the inner product of these two states where we have Euclidean state preparation. And then we evolve forwards and condition on the black hole emitting a particular sequence of Hawking radiation. So you can, you can make a pure state of a black hole by requiring that it um, emit a particular sequence of Hawking quanta at particular times. That data is labeled by these V operators. And we take two different sequences, a sequence of Hawking radiation labeled by these V operators and a sequence labeled by these W operators. And we can consider the inner product of the state of the black hole that's left over after those two different evaporation histories. So we'll denote that as the inner product of W with V. So in Hawking's calculation, if these histories are different, then the leftover states will be close to orthogonal. And I'm going to suppress a little detail here and say that basically the inner product will be zero between these states. At late time though, if we can have lots of different histories of Hawking evaporation, then this is too many orthogonal or nearly orthogonal states. For a real quantum system with finite entropy, inner products between states like this will be sort of erratic. They'll depend on W and V in an erratic way. The typical value will be that the square of this inner product is of order e to the minus s. So it's small but non-zero. And actually this value of e to the minus s is necessary to get the page curve. Roughly trace of rho squared is related to a sum over w and v of this quantity, as um, Jeff explained in a somewhat simpler context in his talk. So the e to the minus s value of this inner product squared 
is closely related to getting the right answer for the Renyi entropy. Okay, so second, um, is the wormhole still there when we try to compute this quantity? And the answer is that it is still there. Um, and what gravity gives is the following answers for this quantity. So the inner product of W and V is computed just by a disk topology. This is basically Hawking, Hawking style calculation. And that gives something that I'll approximate as Kronecker delta of W and V. But the square of this um, inner product gives that contribution to separate disks plus the wormhole. Um, and this is very similar to the wormhole that appeared for the Renyi entropy computation. The replica wormhole that appeared there, it gives a contribution proportional to e to the minus s. <clears throat> so this e to the minus s term is good um, because it gives an answer that's consistent with the page curve. And that's not really too surprising because it's kind of the same wormhole that's appearing in both cases, a wormhole connecting these two copies of the black hole. But now we can see that there's, again, just a flat out contradiction between the answer for this quantity here on the left and the answer for this quantity here. So in order to interpret these computations, we need to go back to some kind of ensemble interpretation where we introduce extra angle brackets and we interpret the gravity as computing the ensemble average of either this inner product or the square of the inner product. So the little summary of this result is that um, these inner products that underlie the computation of the Renyi entropy are given by the same wormhole as the Renyi entropy was, but, well, that's in quotes, but um, now we need an ensemble interpretation. Okay, so let me just say a little bit about the, about the wormhole. You can work it out pretty explicitly um, for let's say JT gravity coupled to matter fields. In the microcanonical ensemble, this wormhole is a classical solution. And the solution's kind of hard to visualize, but um, we can get a sense for what it's like by studying distances between different points on the boundary through the bulk. It gives you kind of a sense of what the geometry looks like. If you know the distance between points on the boundary through the bulk. So let's examine three different points here on these boundary time contours, uh, point one, point two, and point three. Then the result in this solution is that points one and two are close together. And um, the distance between them is uh, this function here. And if T1 is close to T2, then the points are close together. And actually this function, for those of you uh, who've been studying ADS2 will recognize it. This is the distance function that you get on opposite sides of the thermal field double, this two-sided black hole that Juan mentioned. So Sorry, it's... Doug, four more minutes. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so these two points feel as though they're on opposite sides of a thermal field double. In particular, they're close together, even though they're on different disconnected boundaries. Yeah. On the other hand, points one and three they kind of look like they're close together on this diagram here, but they're actually far apart um, due to a back reaction effect associated to the W and V operator insertions. So actually they sort of feel like they're on opposite sides of what you could call an out of time order correlator time fold. The distance function looks like this. It has a piece that's small if the times are equal, but then it has a piece that's big if the times are equal as long as the times themselves are large. So qualitatively, these two sides of this contour are far from each other, but they're close to the corresponding contours on the opposite, um, on the opposite copy. Okay. You can also compute this thing, not classically, but uh, exactly using a quantum description of JT gravity. Um, and an important ingredient in that is this rectangle propagator that takes you from a geodesic of length L to a geodesic of length L prime. It has some expression involving Bessel functions. I'm not going to go through this in much detail, but following work by Phil Saad, there's a really beautiful way of doing these kinds of calculations um, where you just glue together these rectangles. You want to make this cylindrical wormhole, and to make it, you glue together um, a couple of rectangles, 
and um, integrate over the lengths appearing in this propagator. One advantage of going through this quantum calculation is that you find that the answer precisely matches um, an ensemble average computation in a collection of theories described by ETH statistics. So you can get a very precise answer, and that answer very precisely matches um, a reasonable definition of an ensemble average. <clears throat> okay. So let me just conclude here um, by restating the question and some sort of partial answer. So the question we've been discussing is the following. Do the replica wormholes for the page curve need an ensemble interpretation? And well, if you treat the replica wormhole computation as a black box, then no, because the different boundaries are coupled together. So there's no immediate contradiction with a wormhole connecting them. But you can look inside this black box um, at quantities like the square of the inner product that, that are sort of building blocks of the Rennie entropy. And it seems kind of obvious that the simple gravity description that we're using here is not rich enough to describe the true form of this inner product squared, which would depend on W and V in some complicated erratic way, depends on the quantum, quantum noise. A less ambitious theory than, um, than gravity would just break down if you ask it about this type of quantity. But gravity doesn't break down. Um, instead, it gives the answer for an ensemble average. It sees no problem with computing this kind of quantity. And it says the answer, it gives a particular answer, which is um, the answer that you get in an ens ensemble average. So here's a key question that I think we need to think about. Um, in cases where there's no ensemble, so in the bulk dual to n equals four super Yang mills theory, um, are replica wormholes right? Now, the Rennie entropy or the von Neumann entropy, these quantities are self-averaging. So um, an ensemble averaged answer is going to be close to the right answer anyhow. So at the level of the answer, we're going to be close to, to the right answer, even if we um, compute something in a fictitious ensemble. But we could ask for more. Um, we could ask, are replica wormholes actually the first term in some computation that can be systematically improved? Um, and in, if, if so, I, I hope it's true, but if so, um, what is the next term? Okay, so thanks very much for your attention. Um, and I'll stop there. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Douglas. So let's thank uh, Douglas for a very nice talk. You can, uh, react to the um, and we have time for a few questions. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, we have only 10, 10 minutes for questions. Douglas, would you, could do you see raised hands? Would you like to pick your question? Um, let me see. If I do this, has it gone? Um, I'll just stop the share and see. Yeah. Do you see raised hands? Would you like to pick your questions yourself? <laughs> oh, well, I'll just go in order, right? Sudrat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I had a couple of, actually, it's a two part question about the first part of your talk. Uh, in the first part, you were talking about these operators that could create particles behind the horizon. Uh, but I thought the interesting thing would, would be for the operators to be unitary. Because, uh, I mean, just to say, you can always find an operator that acts in this room and that creates the room in the Andromeda galaxy. But that doesn't mean anything because you're only allowed to act with unitary operators and you know, just some operator that uses the entanglement may exist. Uh, so that, that's the first question if you're looking for unitary operators. And second, I, I asked you this earlier, but I'm, I'm still not clear about the answer. Uh, in this work with Kiriakos, we did find such unitary operators uh, that would act on the radiation and create a particle behind the horizon. And the way we did it was we created a particle outside the horizon, and then we pushed it behind the horizon by conjugating it with the modular Hamiltonian. In our case, that was just the Hamiltonian uh, because we were looking at typical black holes. Uh, so I'm wondering if, if this is, if it really uh, turns out to be the same thing or there's actually a distinction between this and this. That's okay. Kind of Okay, thanks, yeah. So the first question, um, the way I like to think about this is the following. This PETS map does not take unitary operators to unitary operators, but it does take Hermitian operators to Hermitian operators. And if you have a Hermitian operator, you can exponentiate it and make it unitary. So 
if you have a Hermitian operator that does close to the right thing, then we can make a unitary operator out of it. So um, re re regarding the second question, I think that the approach that you're describing there is probably closely related to the nice paper by Yiming Chen, where he used something similar. It looks superficially a little bit different from the strategy of the pets map, but maybe there's some deep connection between them. I don't know. Okay. Uh, sorry, but, but just, just to ask about the unitary once more. I mean, as I said, one can find a Hermitian operator in this room that creates the moon in the Andromeda galaxy. No, 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 that's not true. That's not true. I don't think that's true. It's not Hermitian. If you, if you could do that, then you could take a small amount of it and exponentiate it and then sort of slightly create the moon in yeah, using uh, a unitary operator. We, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can chat more, but um, uh, I mean, you can certainly find two Hermitian operators at least, but we, we can talk more about this. Yeah, the, the, the um, weird operators that create elephants somewhere else are not Hermitian. Well, uh, I think you could you could do a lot with Hermitian operators because you know, uh, but we, we we can talk more. I think I think uh, I mean we can we can talk more offline. I think if you anyhow uh, the, not map, the question of phases. So yeah, yeah, but okay. maybe I should. Um, that Ahmed, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, my question is about uh, these black holes where you sort of projected on the state of the Hawking radiation. Is it, is it correct that if you time evolve this state backwards, the black hole probably has shock waves and firewalls and it's just- Yes, whole hell it, it has shock waves. Sorry, just shock waves? Um, well, I don't know if you call a shock wave a fireball, but it has sh shock waves. Okay. But we don't need to do that, use that to do the computation. We just use the forward evolution. Uh, I see, okay, thanks. Um, Greg. Yeah, I had a simple uh, technical question. In your replica uh, approach to calculating the PETS map, why is the analytic continuation in N unique? Oh, well, it's the same kind of discussion as for the von Neumann entropy. And to do it really precisely, to do the, well, okay. The point to is, do it really precisely, we have sine, to do it. Sine, sine pi z is an analytic function that vanishes on the integers. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So there's, yeah, but, but sine pi over two is not zero. There's a, um, there's a, okay. So the place I'm most confident about this in this is in the simple model that Jeff described. And there you can do this computation very precisely and show that there is a representation of this integer n quantity that can be nicely continued in n. So that doesn't mean it's unique. Well, I th no, I think it, 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 does, it does mean it's unique, right? So it, um, there's a um, certain amount of uniqueness that's provided by Carlson's theorem. Um, and so if we do have a nice representation, then it's the unique one with, those, with that that doesn't grow exponentially in N. Well, you need to know something about the asymptotics in, in N. And the point is that you can yes. multiply sine pi z by any entire function. And so yeah, it, well, it's, it's, it's similar to the... Um, it's similar to the entropy computations where this thing is not growing in N. So along the, along the positive real axis, but, right. but what I'm saying is that it's a little different with the half. With the half? So, yeah, because, yeah, because you can multiply some. Well, okay. Never mind. Well, the, the, the half is okay because we have a nice continuation in N just for general N, like complex N. Um, there's a way of writing this where you have a nice continuation in n, complex n, and then n equals minus a half isn't so weird. Probably you mean a nice continuation in a half plane or something. Uh, don't you, Douglas? Um, That's what Carlson's theorem usually involves. Oh, yes, yes, you're right, you're right, you're right. But I think this, it continues to n equals minus a half for this observable. The analog of the half plane would include minus one half because we have a copy of this density matrix inside the operator. So the total number of these things is like um, one plus two n. So the limit n goes to minus one half is like the limit n goes to one in the von Neumann entropy. Um, Sandeep? Yeah, hi Douglas. Um, I want to ask you a question which is a little bit tied to the past, so forgive me. 
a lot of people in the conference and you too evoked the similarities with the wormholes discussed by Coleman, Andy, and Steve Gering and so on. But I think there's a crucial difference, it seems to me. In those cases, ultimately, there was no loss of unitarity. Uh, and it was essentially because you know, the baby universes, since they don't carry off any energy or momentum, have to result in ultra non-local interactions, as a result of which you can rephrase that in terms of a local unitary theory, but with adjustable co uh, uh, coupling constants. Here, it seems wormholes are behaving very differently. Can you comment on this? Oh, it's similar. It's just that the, um, the analog of the adjustable coupling constants is like in the boundary theory, not in the bulk. So the, the bulk description is describing the boundary ensemble. But I, I, it's structurally, I think, quite similar to the, to the Coleman story. But there, you didn't lose unitarity. You, you didn't have well, to you, go... You don't, you don't lose it here either. It's, it's an ensemble average of unitary theories. So the same as with Coleman. Um, Schumit? Hi, I think you probably already answered my question. I was going to ask, uh, is there a clear notion of unitarity in a, in a theory which is an ensemble average? I mean, yeah, yeah. Probability? Well, the, there is, there definitely is. There's the statement that the individual elements of the ensemble should be unitary theories. And then if I get a, a calculate something like a correlation function and look at analytic properties, they would be similar to what in usual field theories would have a following from unitarity? Well, I guess they won't have all the usual properties, like it won't have cluster decomposition, but it will have some of the usual properties, okay. like two point functions at very late time won't decay. Um, Raphael? Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I really like this picture of the black box uh, that you suggested at the end where uh, we need no ensemble interpretation if we just look at the output, um, such as the page curve, but, but uh, if we look inside, um, it looks like we do. And I, I just wanted to see if you agree whether this has something to perhaps tell us about the AMPS paradox and the smoothness of the horizon in the sense that it's only when we look inside the box that we see the smooth horizon. We have these pictures where we're sort of reaching behind the horizon, extracting the information. Um, but that's precisely the picture in which we would need an ensemble dual and so in, in a sense, the dual doesn't actually have the unitarity property that AMPS assumed. Uh, whereas if you, if, you, if you work with a box and don't look inside, uh, then that's great, you get the answer you wanted, but you can just go ahead and still apply the AMPS argument to that. You're asking whether, the, whether there are firewalls in non-disordered theories? I, yeah, I'm asking whether you view that as a, um, reconciliation between the apparent the appearance of a smooth horizon inside the box um, and and the amps argument yeah well I think it's something it's basically a equals RB is the kind of where we're at right now and uh, making sense of that and it, it seems to sort of work I mean you could ask the, the, the other part of the answer to your question is that um, we're now trusting the gravity description more so you, you have to ask it the question that you actually want to ask but then you get to trust its answers. So the, I think if you set up, you know, if we actually ask the question about what happens when you fall across the horizon, then we should take its answer seriously. And the answer is that for most reasonably formed black holes, then the horizon is smooth. Well, that's, that's indeed the answer we get. But if that's the answer that's computed for an ensemble average of, of, of dual theories, of, of true quantum gravity theories, then presumably we don't believe we actually live in a world described by an ensemble average. And, well, and but, so okay, so that. suppose we think that gravity is computing the ensemble average of some honest theories. Then we can ask a question like, if I fall across the horizon, do I measure a firewall in the average of these theories? And the answer is no. And I could ask some, I could ask some question like, uh, that would be sensitive to fluctuations in the ensemble about uh, whether I find in other words, if you believe gravity is computing the average in some ensemble, then computing the, the horizon is smooth and that is enough. I think that, I, pre that presumes that that is a well-defined question in the boundary theory, right? In other words, it, so far what gravity has given us are uh, predictions for things like the thermal entropy and then now the page curve, so the microcanonical entropy of the, of the radiation, all of which are 
clearly objects that have to exist in the full theory because they are asymptotic. I think that's a fair objection. Yeah. Thank you. I think we're out of time, so I'm not sure if I should take further questions uh, or not. Yeah, we're, we're gonna have two more hours of discussion maybe. Or, so Jeff, I just got contact him. So uh, one more question. Okay, Andy? One more, yeah. Um, yes, um, I, a beautiful talk. I, I haven't followed all the details. I have a general question, which is, so there's an ensemble, you're talking about theories in which there's an ensemble average going on, but when you have an ensemble average going on, you would think it would wipe out the page curve, um, would destroy the, the correlations. So how is it that in a theory which produces ensemble averages, there's a formalism which produces ensemble averages, we're also getting a formula that gets the page well, curve. The ensemble averaging happens at the end of the computation. So the type of thing you're worried about is if you do an ensemble average at an intermediate step. We're trying to compute minus trace row log row. If I compute the average of row and stick it in that formula, I'll get a bad answer. But if I do the averaging at the very end, then I get a good answer. And what we're learning is that you just actually have to ask gravity the question very honestly. Not, I want to compute row in gravity and then I'll do the rest of the math. You have to say, I want to compute trace row log row in gravity. And if you do that, then you get the right answer. Uh, or at least you get an answer that's consistent with an ensemble of unitary theories. So it's kind of like your answer to Raphael's question. Yeah. Well, my answer to Raphael's question ended up being that I thought his objection was kind of fair. So I don't know. All right, uh, let's now thank uh, Douglas and all the speakers in the session uh, again. And uh, we are going to take a five minute break and then meet again for a two hour discussion, two hour panel. <laughs>